Uh, welcome and thanks so much for joining us today for the PNAMP Remote Sensing Forum. If we haven't met, my name is Amy Poles and I work for the USGS and the Pacific Northwest Aquatic Monitoring Partnership or PNAMP for short. And I'm Lauren Burns. I'm a fishery biologist with the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission and Amy and I are co-leads for the Remote Sensing Forum. Taking just a quick look at today's agenda, um, after I wrap up the welcome, we'll have a couple of live polls to help us get to know one another. Uh, then we'll have a few updates that I think are of interest to the forum. After that, we'll have two presentations that we're super excited about. Um, and then after each presentation, we'll have time for questions immediately following each one. And then at the end, we'll open it up for further questions and discussion if uh, folks are interested in sticking around. Uh, just a couple of tips on navigating the Teams meeting platform. So please do make sure you're muted when you're not speaking. If you're on the phone, you can use star six to mute and unmute yourself. And if you're using your computer for audio, you do that using the microphone icon on the toolbar. And depending on which version of Teams that you're using, that toolbar might be uh, fixed at the top right of your meeting window, or you might need to hover your mouse to get it to appear near the bottom middle of the meeting window. So we invite you to use the chat at any time. We'll respond to technical issues the best we can, and we will circle back to any questions that you put in there uh, for the speakers during the Q&A. And during the Q&A, we're also going to encourage you to ask questions out loud. So you can raise your hand using the uh, that raise hand icon on the toolbar, and we'll call on you to unmute yourself. All right, so it's always fun to learn a little bit about each other. Uh, so we have a couple of quick polls for you. Uh, there are three ways you can get to the poll. So you really have very limited excuses for not participating. Um, the first option to get to the poll is to click on the link that I will drop into the chat right now. So you should be seeing that. Uh, and then the second option is to go to slido.com and enter the code PNAMBRSF. And then the third option is to use your phone to scan the QR code. Uh, so hopefully you're making your way to Slido now. And I will pass it over to Lauren to ask the first question. All righty. So yeah, we're testing out a new polling application here. So we're asking, what's your favorite holiday dish? And so I'm using my phone. I've scanned the QR code. Um, and I'm sending my response now. So things should be showing up in, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in uh, live time. Green bean casserole, great. Mashed potatoes oh, and yeah. gravy. So yeah, Amy's more familiar with this than I am. But <laughs> is it magnifying um, based on the number of responses? Exactly. Yeah, it's okay. a word cloud. So the more people that um, enter a similar or the same response, the bigger it'll get. Yeah, so I've definitely, definitely already had some eggnog, which uh, it's dangerous. I'm like, I don't Ooh, see any potatoes. cookies. Aren't cookies considered a side dish? <laughs> yeah, that's true. We have a pie. Have apple pie, mold wine, all the pies. Yeah. Mm, awesome. All the pies. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So yeah, this is great. This is, um, the first polling question that we're going to be asking for today. Um, there will be a few more scattered throughout the presentations. Um, and all you have to do is they'll update in live time. So um, just keep your phone or window open that you've been answering in and they should transition for you. Well, we've, we've got one more. Here we go. <laughs> right now. <laughs> all right. Um, so now we're focusing on um, getting a little bit more content and information from our users um, and the folks that are on the call today. Um, so we're really trying to get responses that help us inform the direction of the forum and um, some of the speakers that we might invite for workshops and trainings and webinars. Um, so if you've used satellite imagery or data, have you found it relatively easy to locate and download the data you want? Um, so it looks like overwhelmingly some people say are saying sometimes, which yeah, makes sense. It obviously depends on the application. Um, I would have expected a little bit more no's, I guess, at least from my perspective. What I what I see is just there's so many different data portals, um, and then figuring out the data products that you're getting from those data portals can take a long time. Um, so this is helpful to know. So thank you. It is maybe not surprising that yes is at the very bottom. 
right? <laughs> yeah. It's typically not that easy. All right. Next slide. Um, so for those of you that are new to attending these remote sensing forum webinar meetings, um, we usually like to include a couple just remote sensing forum updates. Um, so some things that we've been updating over the past couple meetings um, are just we submitted a proposal with NASA with the Western Applications um, Office, Western Water Applications Office, um, and received some grant funding, which um, is through CRIPIC, my organization, and PNAMP, Amy's organization, um, to develop a tool, um, which we led into with a previous polling question. Um, so we're going to be developing a tool with um, PNAMP and also Pacific states that will help users um, access remotely sensed data. Um, so more information will, will be coming up. Um, coming up about that in, in the coming year. Um, the other thing that we would like to get input on um, and are hoping to distribute to the community will be put out um, later in 2022. I can't believe I'm saying that. 2022, um, we're drafting a white paper with the organizing committee. Um, so for those of you that are new, uh, the remote sensing for forum is um, run in part by an organizing committee. And one of the goals of the organizing committee is to draft this white paper, which will be used to help um, new UAS programs and pilots um, getting started. So more simply just collecting imagery, stitching that imagery together, some kind of guidelines um, to make it a little bit easier and get off the ground faster. And then the next thing to mark your calendars for, we don't have a date set yet, but um, we do hate, we do hold quarterly meetings. So our next meeting will be scheduled for sometime in March. So if you're not already subscribed for the Remote Sensing Forum listserv and updates, um, make sure you sign up for those to be aware of um, the white paper that we're gonna put out and also meeting updates and calendar invites. All right. The other update we wanted to share um, just has to do with the PNAMP Remote Sensing Forum Microsoft team. Um, so we've set this up for folks to use as an online forum or discussion board. There's three sections or channels as they're called on Teams. One is for Q&A, one's for sharing resources, and one that we're calling meet and greet, um, sort of a networking opportunity. Uh, we're hoping that by having conversations in an open forum, everyone can benefit from that exchange instead of you know things getting buried or concealed in email threads. Uh, so to join the team, you can go to the Remote Sensing Forum project page at pnamp.org, uh, and you'll find the links down at the bottom. And there's also a link to join the listserv. Um, if you have questions about Teams or if you're having trouble getting access, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, and I'll throw the links for the, for the uh, joining the remote Sensing for Microsoft team uh, into the chat right now. I don't actually have the listserv queued up, but I'll throw that in there in a second once I go and grab it. Yeah, join uh, now if you can. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think that's it for updates and I'll pass it back to you, Lauren, to introduce Morgan. All right, so um, we have two wonderful speakers that have agreed to present with us today. Um, the first up is Morgan Bond. Um, he works for NOAA Fisheries and is going to be presenting today on using satellite imagery to inform models of in-stream flow and fish habitat. So Morgan, take it away. And just a reminder, throw any questions into the chat and we'll get to those at um, the end. Thanks. All right, thanks, Lauren. Um, I'm just briefly going to say hello here on the screen because Noah doesn't let me install uh, <laughs> install Teams. And so um, the way I access it is through the browser. And so I'm going to actually go away here in a second when I share my screen. So this is a chance for you all to see me. And I'll come back after my talk um, when my slides are gone. Uh, but thanks so much to Lauren and Amy for uh, inviting me uh, to do this today. So let me just share my slides. Okay, can can somebody give me like a, a thumbs up or? You're good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so I, I want to start out today by just introducing this idea of, of capacity. It's something that we at NOAA and a lot of other partners in the Northwest are thinking a lot about when we're talking about salmon on the landscape. Um, and when we talk about capacity, we're primarily thinking about 
really how many individuals of a given life stage could we reasonably expect to be occupying a, a given habitat? Um, and that's an interesting question because it provides a real nice benchmark for a lot of other things, restoration or maybe historical occupancy or how many fish we might expect if we're opening up a new habitat. Um, and so, so this idea of capacity has become um, really important. But if we wanna do this at large enough spatial scales to be really of interest to managers, that'd be population or sub-basin level or at the ESU scale, um, we need some tools that allow us to make these sort of large scale estimates uh, across the landscape. Here I'm showing an image of uh, the whole Columbia River Basin. Um, and we have these blue lines, that's the National Hydrography data set that really give us an idea of sort of where water is on the landscape. Um, but of course, those are just lines and they don't really tell us much of anything about um, how much habitat is there, or what the quality of that habitat is for fish. Um, and to get at that, we often go directly at these large spatial scales to something like the National Elevation Data Set, which now tells us more than just where is water on the landscape, gives us some idea of what the sort of local topography in that region is, which is going to have a large effect on, on the stream habitat that we ultimately see. So this is sort of just a, a, a nondescript uh, river valley. You can see those blue lines uh, moving through this valley. And you can see that we get some information um, about the surrounding landscape from this elevation data set. But it's a 10 meter uh, a horizontal resolution. And so um, although we get some information, we are a bit limited. And so the things that we often try to estimate from these two pieces of information, the, the uh, blue lines or the, the national uh, hydrography data set, and then the, the local topography from, from the 10 meter data that is available essentially everywhere um, is something like slope. So what's the, what's the gradient or slope of the stream? Um, how wide is the valley? How confined is this stream from those pieces of information or, or how sinuous might the stream be? And then we estimate a lot of things from something like catchment area, how much precipitation might we assume to accumulate in an area or um, something about um, sediment accumulation, et cetera. So although these are all really useful pieces of information, um, they're somewhat limited in what we can do with that if we really want to know how fish are using a given habitat, or in particular, how that habitat changes with changing conditions, in particular with changing flow. And so the question that I want to pose today, you know, is how is stream habitat changing with flow? Can we estimate this at, at larger and larger spatial scales to really answer questions of interest for managers? Um, in particular, we think about water buybacks or, or flow restoration as being a fairly prominent and, and somewhat common restoration tool, we really like to be able to know, you know, what are we getting as far as fish habitat goes um, when we put more water in the stream? Or if we're losing water, uh, how much habitat are we actually losing? And other than at very localized scales, we often don't know. We assume, you know, we're putting water back, we're creating habitat, but we often don't have a great estimate of, of exactly what we're getting for that. Similarly, um, a lot of predictions of climate change are predicting in, in many areas, maybe higher winter flows where we're getting precipitation as rain instead of snow, or maybe even lower uh, summer minimum flows. Um, how much habitat are, are we losing at those low flows? We'd like to be able to make those estimates at scale. Um, and then, you know, finally, and the, the question that I'm going to end with at the end of the talk today, you know, is, is the habitat there? when the fish need it. And particularly we're thinking about um, some of this ephemeral habitat or habitats that are only available uh, at certain times a year at certain flows like floodplain habitats. Um, is that matching up with, with when the fish need that? And if we predict changes in that, um, how is that gonna affect uh, habitat availability and, and ultimately capacity? Um, and so I think traditionally, if you wanted to answer this question, um, the go-to, uh, method would be let's build a hydraulic model for our stream or region of interest. And so for that, we need much, much more detailed information about both the topography of the surrounding landscape, um, but also the bathymetry of the stream itself. And so there's a number of methods to get those pieces of information. 
could be um, remotely sensed, could be from fixed wing aircraft or drones, um, or we could be basically going out with a old school total station and uh, tromping around in the stream to get uh, bathymetry data that way. Um, but either way, you're building a point cloud and then you're using that detailed topography and bathymetry to then model how is flow gonna move across the landscape. Um, the disadvantage to this is that we don't have all that information everywhere. Um, and these models are, are complex and, and can be um, uh, you know, laborious to, to assemble. And so, um, and so we, you're sort of asking the question, you know, is, is there another approach if we really want to know essentially just what habitats are being inundated at a given flow? And so we're sort of turning this idea of a hydraulic model on its head where a hydraulic model is asking, you know, at any given flow, how much habitat do we expect to be inundated or wetted? Um, and, and instead, we can go back and use some remotely sensed data like satellite imagery to ask, okay, in the past, at any given uh, time when we have an image of the landscape, what was the flow and how much habitat was wetted at that time? If we have enough of these sort of serially produced images, um, we can ask, you know, how does that relationship build um, with respect to both wetted habitat and the flow? And so here I'm just throwing three example images um, from a low flow conditions on the left, from the same site up through higher flow conditions on the right. And you can see that as flow increases, as you would expect, more of this habitat is becoming wetted. And we're, we're doing things like uh, you see at the middle panel, 56 cubic meters per second, we're starting to open and activate this side channel. Um, and then it's, it's fully inundated at um, this 200 meter per second or sorry, 200 cubic meter per second flow. And so if we build up a series of these images over time, we can essentially generate some of the inf same information, the, not all of it, but some of the same information you would get from hydraulic modeling without knowing anything about the actual bathymetry of this stream. The same approach could then be used to do some, say, validation of wetted surface area from um, more detailed hydraulic modeling efforts. Okay, so to do this, we need some pretty high resolution information, um, as you can imagine, if we're trying to get uh, information about specific streams. And so to do this, we're using um, the WorldView uh, 2 and, and 3 satellite imagery, um, in part because this is the highest resolution imagery available um, commercially, and um, also because these satellites have now been in the sky long enough that um, they've actually built up quite a catalog of images that we can go back to about 2010 to sort of extract imagery that we want to use to build these relationships. Um, and so this is the same imagery that um, Google Earth uses for almost all of its um, views. So if you've spent some time looking at Google Earth, you're probably looking at, at worldview imagery almost everywhere uh, at this point. And the resolution is, is and this is going to become important later, but, you know, about a meter um, and so much, much higher resolution than something like uh, Landsat. So when you look at something like Google Earth, you're looking at what we sort of call a true color image. Um, so it's really just the blue, green, and, and red bands that are a composite that give you the image that you see. But the worldview imagery actually has a lot more information uh, inside of it that we can unlock. Um, and so there are eight color bands uh, available including some in the uh, near infrared part of the spectrum, which is really important um, for separating some types of habitats apart. Um, and so here I'm showing uh, a false color image of uh, NDVI, the uh, normalized difference vegetation index that I'm sure people have, have seen before. Um, sometimes they're colored differently, but um, the sort of result is the same. It's, it's often used to get vegetation health. And this is using different bands than we see on the image in the left, which is that, that true color image. And you can see that you're starting to separate different aspects of the landscape um, with these different bands. And with eight image bands, there are actually many combinations um, of these bands that you can put together to create these sort of false color ratios. Uh, we have settled on uh, seven different uh, ratios uh, that we add to the original eight bands. 
And there's also a panchromatic band, which is this, we think about as sort of a, a black and white, I guess, band that's higher resolution. I'll talk about more in a second. Um, and so we actually create all these indices for a given image and smash them all together and create a 16 band composite image um, that we can then try to do some more automated classification because if we're gonna do this uh, classification of habitat using serial imagery through time, um, we can't do it by hand and we need to use a computer to, to do the classification for us. Um, and so um, I don't wanna get bogged down in this too much, but I think if people are thinking about doing this kind of stuff, there's some, some important nuance and I wanna just spend just a second thinking about um, these different uh, resolution bands. And so I mentioned that there was a panchromatic band that is higher resolution. Um, so this is giving us a resolution from the, the Worldview 2 panchromatic band of a little less than half a meter. Uh, the Worldview 3 is closer to a third of a meter. So with this, panchromatic band, we're actually able to resolve some pretty fine scale features on the landscape. You can see there, this is a part of the John Day River. Um, there's, there's some small channels that just look like little threads in this image, um, but you can pick them out. You can pick out in, in many cases, you know, individual logs in a log jam. Um, and so this panchromatic band seems to be pretty useful. Um, what's tricky is that all of that, the, multi-band imagery that I just showed you, the color imagery is at a higher resolution. And so if we switch to that higher resolution, this is that true color image from the same exact scene, you can see it starts to look a little pixelated. Um, these Worldview 2 color bands are, are now well over a meter of resolution. Um, and so those smaller uh, sort of thread-like streams that are approaching the resolution of that panchromatic band almost disappear in this part of the image. And so there's certainly a lower limit to um, the types of habitats that we can characterize with this imagery. And I'm gonna zoom in even further on a section of the river that has a, a small side channel shown with this uh, yellow box. If we zoom in on that, you can see with our, again, our high resolution panchromatic band, we can see that there's a side channel there. It's a couple meters wide or so, um, but it's looking pretty pixelated and defining the actual edges of that feature is somewhat tricky. Um, and yet that is exactly what we're trying to do um, with this type of classification, either by hand or by uh, machine learning. So um, we need a way to sort of try and identify and separate the edges of these, of these habitats. Um, and again, if we take this exact same scene, we look at it with the color imagery, you can see now um, we're really starting to lose information about that relatively small side channel, which is which is basically at the resolution of the, the color imagery. Um, and so we can't discern a lot about what's going on there. And so what we actually do is sort of mash these two bands together, the, the panchromatic band that's higher resolution and then the low resolution color imagery. Um, and that's important because as I mentioned before, um, when we're classifying this imagery, even by hand, um, we need to make at some level a decision about which of these things are water and which of them are not water. Um, and you may uh, sort of drive across this and decide some pixels are water and some are not. And those two pixels, one water and one not, may have the exact same uh, underlying value uh, of, of um, the, the value that they're giving from, from the satellite. And yet we called one water and one not. And so how do we then separate these two in, in a meaningful way? And again, sort of look at the color. In the color imagery, those two pixels, one we maybe called water and the other not, actually have the exact same value um, because they both fall inside of this, this pixel. So we need a better way to, to separate those out. And we use a deep learning modeling process because in this case, we are not treating pixels as individual pieces that are discrete, we're actually looking at collections of pixels and how they relate to one another. Um, and that helps us define these edge features from that panchromatic band and then pull in what information we have from the color bands. So we do the best we can by hand digitizing an image. And then we feed this into uh, a deep learning model. This is a commercially available model, um, although it uses some open source um, modeling processes under the hood. 
Um, and so we hand digitize an image and feed it into a, a deep learning model. And then we use that model to make predictions about a, a much larger piece of the landscape. We sort of look at those predictions and if we like them, we sort of clean them up and then feed that back into the model to predict another larger piece and so on and so forth. And in, in doing so, we're able to build up essentially such a large catalog of, of water features that we can sort of overwhelm these small inaccuracies in the initial hand digitized data. And in many ways, I think, um, where we've looked at this in as much detail as we can, the, the uh, resulting model that we get um, actually ex sort of exceeds the ability of a, an operator that's digitizing by hand to um, correctly classify the water. So the model, I think, it outperforms uh, the people uh, eventually once we, we build up a, a large enough data set. And, and you really do need um, a pretty huge data set. Our current uh, set of training data for the model that predicts water contains over 30 billion individual pixels. Um, each one you know, is roughly a half meter square. Um, and we try and stratify these over all of the potential satellites that we're using, um, as well as various seasons, and then lots of different locations. So the several thousand square kilometers of um, land surface that we're classifying um, the water in uh, with this particular model. So um, this takes a long time. We, it's a convolutional neural network. I'm not going to be able to talk more today about the sort of specifics of the model itself. Um, but these things are very sort of slow to train, uh, even on a high performance uh, computing environment, it takes several days to train this model um, because it cycles over those 30 billion pixels many times over that, that two days. So it's, it's constantly um, searching back over the, that training data set. And in doing so, we're tuning a bunch of parameters in this model. And when I say a bunch, I mean millions of parameters. So there are something like 10 million parameters um, in this model, and that gives it a huge amount of flexibility, uh, but it also makes it slow to train. The big advantage of these models, in addition to their accuracy um, and, and ability to pull features uh, out of imagery, is the fact that once they are tuned, they are very fast and they exceed other machine learning products like random forest models, um, et cetera, in their prediction speed. So it takes us a while to build these models, but once we have the model, we can really um, churn through quite a bit of imagery in fairly short order. So we're predicting something like 1600 square kilometers of satellite imagery uh, per hour. And, and so even for a large watershed, um, that's a lot of, a lot of data. Um, these models, the current water model that I'm talking about today has a very high accuracy. Um, although um, accuracy in itself is, is fairly misleading, we use something called an F1 score, which is uh, a combination of the precision and recall, or if you think back to your intro statistics class, this is essentially an estimate of type one and, and type two error. Um, but we have a very high F1 score, which means um, that the, the model is doing a good job of identifying the water that's on the landscape and it's not identifying um, things that are not water as water. It's a little confusing, but um, it's, a, it's a well performing model as far as we can tell. So what does this actually look like? Um, well, we've taken each, we, we, we need to define some area for each part of the stream that we're gonna, um, that we're gonna classify. And so we've taken uh, streams throughout the Columbia Basin and broken them into 200 meter reaches we estimate a floodplain, and then we chunk up that floodplain and assign a portion of the floodplain to each one of those 200 meter reaches. And that is shown here in the blue sort of triangular shaped box. This is a way we've broken up that floodplain to represent um, the area that we think is relevant for this section of stream, this 200 meter reach. And then we run our model across that and shown in blue here is what the model is predicting is the wetted area of that. Model. We have a, a separate model that I'm not talking about today, which estimates um, sandbars or gravel bars. And that's what you see in, in the yellow here. And so under low flow conditions, and we, we like to test this in, in pretty um, uh, small streams that are getting down, down near the resolution limit of our imagery, as well as these, these habitats where there's a lot of complexity um, to sort of challenge this process or this model. Um, so under low flow conditions here, you can see there's um, 
there's a lot of uh, um, sort of variation in the in the habitat and in the areas that are wetted. If we look at this exact same scene um, with a different image taken on a different day with much higher flows, you can see that we we have a lot more wetted habitat. Essentially, all those sandbar areas are now uh, inundated, and so we've now generated a very simple relationship between the flow at each day when these satellite images were taken, and then um, the resulting amount of, of habitat that's out there in the landscape. And so we do this over and over again, we can start to develop uh, a relationship. And this is a relationship for a, a different reach um, in the Wenatchee Basin, um, where we have, in this case, uh, seven images that we've predicted. And in places where we don't have USGS uh, gauge data, we use the National Water Model uh, predicted stream flow, which is a, a weather service uh, produced um, estimate of flow that we can assign to essentially any image taken in the last 10 or 15 years. And so we generate this relationship and not in all places is it linear like this, although over this range of images, it tends to be fairly linear. And now we have a relationship that we can use to essentially ask how much wetted surface area is there at any flow in this range. Um, and so we can build this up over lots and lots of stream segments for an entire uh, basin or, um, or, or area of interest. So uh, if we return to our current modeling approaches in the, the John Day River, Middle Fork John Day, you can see in the Middle Fork John Day, the area that I've, I've shown here in yellow is essentially the, the channel that is primarily wetted at, at base flow. Um, and we might be interested in when fish have access to these floodplain habitats that we know are really important for um, early rearing uh, of juvenile, in particular Chinook in, in this area um, and ask, you know, do we, can we estimate what flows are needed in order for fish to have access to those habitats? And so um, if we look beyond that base flow condition, we, we estimate that the area shown here in orange is the area where um, we'd expect at higher flows, fish to be able to um, access these habitats. And so we can use that as sort of our, our base reference and ask, you know, when are we seeing water or what flows really are we seeing water across the landscape? Um, and, and so in first cut, we, we need to know, do, you know, do we have enough imagery really <laughs> to uh, make this assessment? Um, and if we look at the hydrograph of the Middle Fork John Day, um, from the USGS gauge day, you can see that on average, and this is a uh, average hydrograph over the last uh, 30 years or so, um, you can see that on average, you know, in sometime in late March, early April, we get this big jump in the hydrograph where uh, we start getting snow melting. And um, this is when we'd expect to have a lot of these habitats becoming inundated. It's also when we have emergent Chinook fry that are looking for these floodplain habitats. We know that they're really important for growth um, for those, those periods of time when that habitat is accessible because by uh, June or July, we get this big precipitous drop back down to base flow conditions. And so those floodplain habitats are only accessible uh, on an average year for a pretty limited period of time. And we'd like to be able to characterize exactly what those flow thresholds are when uh, fish have access to it. And so if we overlay on top of this, the available satellite imagery that we have, uh, at least as far as day of the year, um, you can see that we, we have a lot of imagery at, at fairly low flows and only a handful of images at very high flows. But um, we do have a fair bit of imagery on this kind of descending limb that allows us to characterize the shape of that relationship. Um, and I don't have uh, data from that to show you today. We're actually um, refining these models right now for the John Day so that we can uh, finish this prediction. So in, in a few weeks or so, we should have um, the actual uh, predictions from this and these relationships for each one of those uh, 200 meter reaches. So, um, there are both some advantages to this approach and there are a, a fair number of caveats as you might imagine. Um, so the advantages are that there's a lot of satellite imagery available. It does vary quite a bit by region. And so um, it's not widely available for all streams, um, although there is some just about everywhere we look. Um, 
These models, once we've trained them, as I mentioned, are, are fairly fast to predict um, from the imagery. And then we have a handful of other models that I don't have time to talk about today that are trying to estimate other things that in particular things you would not get from hydraulic modeling, things like um, area, sandbar area or gravel bar area, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we have a forest cover model. And then we've, we've got a handful of sort of more experimental models looking at um, just that panchromatic high resolution band, trying to estimate things like, um, like wood jams or, or uh, wood in the streams uh, to the extent that that is visible. Um, caveats are, are many. Um, one of the big one is that, you know, unlike LIDAR, we can't see through clouds or trees. And so there's a lot of imagery um, that is unusable because it's either cloudy or smoky when the image is taken, um, or uh, we have a complete tree cover in an area. So uh, we can't see the stream visually at all. Um, the other thing is that even uh, in places where we can see the stream, um, we don't necessarily see all the water, right? Some emergent vegetation may be sort of masking wetted areas in, in flooded locations. Um, and then there are things like flooded forests that we know are prominent in some areas where we are not gonna be able to see um, that water well. Um, those imagery dates vary widely, unlike Landsat imagery that's taking essentially a picture of the entire globe every week or so. Um, these are sort of more haphazard, I guess, when, when the commercial satellites are taking picture of, of a given region of interest. Um, and we don't have tasking ability, so we don't get to pick when they do um, their images. Um, and then, of course, we're only getting the surface area. So unlike a hydraulic model, which is going to get more detailed information about depth and velocities um, at, at particular locations that might be of interest for you know, bioenergetics modeling, et cetera, um, we're really just getting wetted surface area. Um, and then as I showed maybe in too much detail earlier, um, you know, a lot of the places where we know fish are using um, and are of interest to us um, are really close to or maybe exceeding the resolution of even this high resolution imagery. And so um, that is sort of unsatisfying because this is a, a far, you know, much better information than we were getting from, um, again, from like the 10 meter digital elevation models, but it still um, is lacking in some places or leaves us wanting more. And so with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing and come back and I think I have maybe time to answer a couple questions. Yeah, let's do um, five or so questions or five or so minutes of questions, not five questions. Um, thanks, Morgan, that was really great. Um, it's a really great example of using a historical widely available data set to kind of attack a common problem in a different way. And I'm always a big fan of that. So with that, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, if there's anybody that has a question for Morgan right now, um, please use the raise your, raise your hand feature. Um, and if you're available to, um, yeah, please turn, turn on your camera if you can. So it looks like we have two questions. Brandon, I saw you come in first, so go ahead. Hey, thanks for that presentation, Morgan. That was really fantastic and a great overview. Um, I just had a question about the um, horizontal accuracy of the worldview data and if that plays into your your modeling or if you're actually trying to correct that um, before you, you dig in. When you say, are we trying to correct that, you mean are we like pan sharpening imagery or something prior to mm -hmm. including in the model or? or no, um, I, I'm what? speaking towards the georeferencing um, issues with worldview. Like, you know, yeah. scenes can be shifted like up to you know six to ten meters from from scene to scene. Does that yes? Kind of and it 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 may. I think it does influence the results a bit. That's one of the reasons actually why we are not trying to look at shifts in um, a, say land cover from scene to scene for a given. Uh, pixel, it's really for this larger floodplain region. That's kind of why we've chart chosen these larger regions where I think that some of those inaccuracies in the scene shifting um, are, are essentially washed out by the fact that we're looking over a very large area. Um, obviously, 
if you move things out of that floodplain area or into that floodplain area, it's still going to cause um, some problems. But but that is actually one of the reasons why, again, we were really just classifying these sort of what's going on within a 200 meter reach rather than what's going on at something much smaller, if that makes sense. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Brandon um, and Sarah. Go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. That was really um, informative. And I was curious um, what software you were using to develop and train your models. Yeah, so we use um, we we do a lot of our sort of image processing in uh, Harris Geospatial's Envy uh, package, and we use their deep learning package essentially to train these models. So it's it's not again. I, I sort of mentioned this. It's not an unfortunately an open source model at this point. Um, although there are lots and lots of open source mo models that you could use that do essentially the exact same thing. You know, this is a this is a a TensorFlow based convolutional neural network model under the hood. You know, it's just running in Python um, uh, under the IDL script that Envy uses. Um, but we have licenses available for that, so we decided to to go ahead and use it, and it's it's worked uh, pretty well for us. It just makes it hard for us to share that the underlying model with other people, which is sort of unfortunate. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like we have time for one more question. If there's somebody else out in the audience that wants to ask a question for Morgan, oh great, uh, Jane, go ahead. Hi. Thank you for the presentation. Sorry, I'm just getting my camera on. Um, very cool. So I was I was kind of curious if you could talk a little bit more about the um, <clears throat> the hydrology data that you use. So how you sync up? And I know I'm I, I get it that you use like gauge data where you can, and then the NBM and other areas. But since there's so much uncertainty in a lot of the the hydrology data. I'm just wondering how how you're tackling that um, for the the imagery, and then um, you know how we might be able to use these data kind of in smaller watersheds where we might not have the the, the gauge data. If, if that makes sense. I mean, maybe I'm not being super clear with my question, but I'm just I am interested in this kind of flipping the hydraulic model upside down and having the queue before the yeah. symmetry. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so I mentioned that we use the national water model um, retrospective predictions. I don't know if, if um, and I didn't talk really about that at all, um, and I apologize for that. So the Water Prediction Center um, Produces the national water model, which is um, which is essentially trying to hindcast flows, hourly flows for every NHD reach in the country going back to the 80s. So um, that model works pretty well for unimpounded streams, and so. Um, for very small streams, and you mentioned small streams, um, for very small streams, you know, there are inaccuracies in that model because they're essentially creating a network and trying to, to um, take what gauge data there are and, and sort of back that up into um, uh, all these smaller, uh, smaller order streams. So um, below impoundments, it's terrible because they can't take, uh, you know, dam operations into account very well. Um, in in unimpounded areas, it's got a fairly high R squared with the sort of gauge data. Um, so that's basically what we're we're using in in areas like I showed the Middle Fork John Day. Um, you know, we use the USGS gauge just because it provides the reference of interest, right? Um, I might know from the water model the flow at some place upstream, but that's not really relevant to a manager who wants to know. If I wants to be able to look at the gauge at Ritter and say, okay, how much water is is flooded upstream? And that works well because in the area of our interest, there aren't a lot of other inputs. Um, and so we can just use the gauge data. But 
yeah, so so we use the water model. Um, it does have errors, and and the smaller the stream or the more regulated the flow, the higher that error is. Um, I don't know of a good solution other than to have you know some kind of a reference um, in a given stream of interest, you know, where you've you've essentially got a stage height and you go out and measure flow and and try and get at least a reference location um, where you know stage height and uh, flow. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a there's a silver bullet there, but that's what we do. And that that water model, if people are interested in um, water model data, retrospective model water model data is available freely. It's on Amazon, AWS. You can just download it. Um, so sorry, I, I don't know if that I don't know if that's helpful, but it's very helpful. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, yeah. It's got me, you know, thinking for future. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks again, Morgan. Um, I'm going to cut off Q&A for your component of the presentation here, and then we can continue. I have a couple questions that I'd like to ask if we have time later. Um, so thanks again. Uh, appreciate appreciate you being willing to present. And it sounds like you have more material, so maybe yeah. we'll be reaching out in the future. Yeah, stay tuned. Um, thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so with that, I'd like to quickly transition to our second speaker today. Um, we have Nick Wagner with us from Salmon Watch. Um, he's a program manager there, um, um, also with the World Salmon Council and um, the owner of Drone Foresight or Foresight Drone Services. Sorry about that, Nick. Um, and today I'm really interested in his presentation. He's going to be talking about um, a recent campaign that he went on um, and the title of his presentation is Marine Debris T Detection and uh, with Amphibious Fixed Wing UAS, Stories from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Uh, so welcome, Nick, and uh, take it away. Thanks, Lauren. Can you hear me? Yep. Thank you. All right. Great. Just getting my... Oh, I botched that. Sorry. How's that? Yep, I can see your presentation now. Great. Thanks for the intro. Thrilled to be here to participate in this forum. Uh, thanks, Lauren and Amy, for creating this space and uh, providing the opportunity for sharing and learning today. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Nick Wagner, and I get the pleasure of sharing some uh, stories with you from a uh, uh, far off expedition. Uh, oh, one thing about the introduction, Lauren, I'm no longer the program manager with, with uh, Salmon Watch at the World Salmon Council. I've uh, been uh, getting my calendar full of uh, a drone work, which is great, uh, and that, that's the place I want to be. Uh, primarily, the work that I'm doing is locally here in the Pacific Northwest with land trusts and watershed councils, others who are stewarding the land and freshwater ecosystem. But this presentation is about uh, the plight of plastics in our marine environment. Uh, the marine debris detection with amphibious fixed-wing UAVs, uh, stories from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Uh, you'll hear me say GPGP GP, uh, for short. Uh, this is going to be a little bit more like a uh, show and tell than uh, the Morgan's presentation, uh, which was really great. So six weeks this past August and September of this year, I uh, had the pleasure of partnering with the nonprofit Oceans Unmanned out of California on a project to assist the ocean cleanup to use UAVs for the detection of floating ocean debris. The ocean cleanup is a nonprofit based in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. The primary purpose of the offshore campaign was for the ocean cleanup to test its latest iteration of a plastic harvesting device, uh, which I'll share a, a little bit about in this presentation. My piece of the work was conducting fixed wing UAV missions to research the concentration and composition of the marine debris in the GPGP. I'm going to spend a bit of time speaking about the, the context and the concept for this work uh, and then and then some details about the operations. I could talk for hours about the details of those and the, the post processing, but um, I'm going to summarize things and uh, be sure to leave time in the Q&A to drill down into whatever topics are of interest to folks. My personal context starts here. These are photographs uh, by Chris Jordan, an American artist and photographer and that I, I first saw back in 2009 or 2010. His work, uh, Midway, Messages from the Gyre, left these images imprinted on my psyche 
in no uncertain terms and with no embellishments, uh, uh, from my perspective, they showed the direct relationship between human garbage and impacts on the ecosystem. And as a bird watcher and bird lover, these photos had a had a big impact on me. Of course, there's also many scientific publications out there on the Lazen and black-footed albatross of Midway and the uh, plastic ingestion and effects on those populations. I could share a whole slideshow full of grotesque images of plastic ingestion and entanglement to remind us of the effects of this problem, but I'll, I'll keep it to just this one. As we were headed out to the GPGP, a uh, five and a half day transit by ship, I was in the midst of reading the late great Barry Lopez's final title, Horizon, and this quote stood out to me. Many cultures are still distinguished today by wisdoms not associated with modern technologies, but grounded instead in an acute awareness of human foibles, of the traps people tend to set for themselves as they, as they enter the ancient labyrinth of hubris or blindly pursue the appeasement of their appetites. I don't think it's my culture that Lopez uh, referred to as distinguished and with wisdom. Instead, I relate more to and am associated more with the modern technology, consumerism, and blind pursuit of appetite culture. Uh, and this work, which I'm about to share with you, helps to illuminate the effects of our appetites and, and shine a little light on this labyrinth we find ourselves in. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Uh, if you Google, uh, do a Google image search, uh, you get returns that look a lot like this clickbaity picture uh, on this slide. And in fact, most of my friends and family asked me about my trip to the trash island. But just this picture in particular, you know, the astute observer will notice that you can see land on the left side of this photo. And indeed, this is not a picture of the GPGP. Well, of course, this plastic may end up there one day. This is not what the GPGP looked like when we arrived, and I'll be sharing several of my photos of the garbage patch in a few slides. Well, I recognize this is a geospatial community, and you all likely have a great mental globe in your minds. If you're like me, I function best with a firm geolocation in my mind for presentations like this, so let's get on the map. This is a conceptual map from NOAA showing the two garbage patches of the Pacific. Uh, this project took place at the Eastern or uh, North Pacific Subtropical Gyre, also known as the GPGP. Uh, the offshore portion of this work started in Victoria, British Columbia, and we sailed five and a half days to 34.85 degrees north, 145.9 degrees west, um, approximately 1400 miles offshore. A few stats about the GPGP. Uh, it's estimated to have 79 million kilograms of plastic debris as of 2017. Uh, the size of the patch estimated 1.6 million square kilometers, about two times the size of Texas. Uh, estimated at 60 kilograms of plastic debris per square kilometer. And globally, there's still 1.15 to 2.41 million metric tons bleeding into the oceans from rivers each year. Uh, these next few slides are from past uh, ocean cleanup research publications. Uh, they're, of course, not the only publications available out there. And, uh, you know, this isn't meant to be a com comprehensive report of the composition of the GPGP. But I, I share their work here um, because it's the prior art that this project evolved from. So the, these next few slides are from a study published in 2018 in Nature. Uh, where the ocean cleanup did a series of trawls with a research vessel as well as some volunteer vessels to characterize the GPGP. And the vessels towed manta trawls, which are repurposed plankton nets, uh, maybe some of you are familiar with, uh, that do a great job of catching even very small microplastics, but they cover relatively small areas and are biased towards smaller debris. So uh, in addition to long distance surveying flights of a manned aircraft were conducted from uh, California uh, over the GPGP. They're shown on this map in, in light blue. The, the vessel trawls are, are shown in gray and, and dark blue, but the aerial surveys are in light blue. 
So the images from these uh, flights are, are what have helped to characterize the, the large de debris in the, in the patch. Now that data was compiled together to produce this modeled mass concentration map and help to redefine the boundary of the GPGP to that 1.6 million square kilometer estimate. Uh, on this map, it's a logarithmic scale with the dark blues uh, 0 0.01 kilograms of plastic debris per square kilometer. And then the light blues are 10 times more dense, uh, yellow is 100 times more dense, and so on and so forth with the, the reds uh, highest concentration at the center of the patch. Uh, so those concentrations in the center are up to uh, 1,000 or 10,000 times higher than those areas outside the patch. So the plastic characterized in this uh, study uh, was categorized into four uh, categories um, with microplastics on the left being less than 0.5 centimeters up to megaplastics greater than 50 centimeters on the right. The uh, megaplastics make up the greatest uh, contributor to the mass load uh, as shown on the on the right in this bar. Uh, one thing to note about megaplastics, it's true for all the marine plastics, they'll break down into smaller pieces over time. So removing them when they're large is advantageous. Uh, these megaplastics make up 53% of the total mass of the debris in the GPGP. Um, and uh, circled here, the, the upper part of this right bar, the light blue, um, represents uh, fishing nets and uh, fishing nets alone make up 46, sorry, 46 percent of the total load. So then looking at the numerical concentrations, this is the number of pieces of plastic in a given category per square kilometer. As you would guess, the numerical concentrations shown on the left axis, uh, this purpley gray line uh, shows smaller debris and higher concentrations up to 1 million pieces per square kilometer of the microplastics, whereas the concentrations of larger plastics is lower, uh, below 10 pieces per square kilometer. So I, I show all of this uh, to give some context because our, our goal with this UAV work was to try to tune this number on the right, specifically for large debris greater than 50 centimeters and help to start filling in the map and, and model with more data. All right, so what does the GPGP really look like? Wah, wah. Sorry, no trash island. Um, and uh, to be honest, no obvious concentrations uh, visible at all. I was expecting to see some wind rows or other aggregations, but I uh, never did see anything uh, with the naked eye. Uh, there's uh, 10,000 times more plastic debris in this place than near to shore. But where is it? So here's a slightly more helpful picture of what the GPGP really looks like. Uh, this is a little bit easier with this elevated viewpoint uh, looking down from the ship uh, towards the water. Here you can see a, a crate. Um, and you can see in the top right one other piece, some uh, red piece of junk. So this is it. We made it to the GPGP. Time to clean it up. So as mentioned before, the primary mission of this expedition was to test the ocean cleanup's latest trash collection device, uh, seen here uh, partially deployed um, for the first time. Uh, it was all snow white uh, and nice and clean. It uh, had never been put together before. We loaded it on the ship in, in Victoria, BC for the first time. Eventually these two long wings uh, with a central extraction zone would be deployed into the water. And then the two ships would steam forward at a slow speed and funnel the plastic debris into the extraction zone to be removed. Uh, there's lots more information about this effort on the Ocean Cleanup's webpage. They love to talk about it. So if you're interested, you can uh, check it out there. The secondary mission for the offshore work was that of the UAV operations. So. The goals for our work uh, were these three. First one, answer the question, was this approach and platform suitable to the application and the environment? Uh, two, very little is known about the composition and concentration of the GPGP, especially the, the large debris. So 
Our second goal is to collect data to feed the research on this subject. And number three, can the UAV data be used to guide the trash collecting device to local hotspots? The concept was fly a survey grid, maximize the coverage area, keep a 2.5 centimeter per pixel ground sampling distance, post-process those images with an artificial intelligence intelligence algorithm for marine, uh, sorry, for debris detection and map those detections. The system chosen for this mission was the Aramayo Talon Amphibious. Aramayo is a small business based in Ontario, Canada. This platform is based on the PixHawk RG Pilot open source ecosystem. It's powerful, but scary. Uh, it has a semi-integrated Sony RX0 15 megapixel camera. It's RGB only. Uh, vehicles hand launched from the upper deck of the ship and landing is an automatic belly landing on the water, mostly automatic, sometimes manual. Um, and uh, recovery via uh, workboat, which I'll, I'll share more about. The ground control station is the open source uh, mission planner software. The other thing to mention is that it's a two person flight crew system. This is my co pilot, Jared Crane. Jared is a whiz on the sticks, as they say, on the remote control and uh, recent graduate, uh, graduate of Kansas State's unmanned aerial systems bachelor's degree program. All right, enough talking. Let's fly this thing. So typically we weren't filming any uh, video, um, but uh, we did allow the videographer from the ocean cleanup to stick a GoPro 360 to the belly of the town for one flight. Uh, this is a typical takeoff in moderate winds and um, the 21 meter starting altitude above the water helped to make all of our launches pretty uneventful. For our flight parameters, uh, we we flew most of our missions at 80 meters above sea level uh, for a 2.26 centimeter GSD. Uh, we had 0% side lap since uh, we were not going to stitch the images together. We wanted to maximize the coverage area. We used 50% front lap to collect more imagery and more data for this experimental expedition. Um, Originally, we were planning on doing a 0% uh, front lap as well and just having a, a, a quilt, uh, you know, single coverage of the entire area. But uh, we, we noticed that we missed a lot of uh, debris in the images or we suspected that we did uh, just with wave crests and sun glint. And so given that we could get twice as many images uh, for free, so to speak, uh, with the same endurance uh, and same area covered, uh, we ended up taking um, uh, upping the, the front lap to 50%, so we had two chances to detect each piece of debris. We got up to 86 minutes flight time from the Talon, and uh, that resulted in our largest coverage area at 6.2 square kilometers. We weren't there to test the range of the platform, so in our normal operations, we maxed out at 4.8 kilometers distance from the ground control station. We saw some minor signal signal degradation issues, but generally we had strong connectivity. And then at the end of the flight, uh, you know, with an amphibious UAV, the uh, the whole ocean is the landing strip. Uh, the biggest challenge was uh, adapting the flight plan to accommodate for a, a ship on the move, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that coming up, but. For safety reasons regarding the recovery option operation with the workboat, we kept the splash down as close as possible to the ship. Typically, we aim for about 400 meter buffer and landed alongside the ship. The whole goal was just don't crash it into the ships because that was the only thing to crash it into out there.
So then the other piece of this operation that was new to all of us was recovering an amphibious drone floating in the middle of the ocean with a small boat. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see it, but it's there by the by the red arrow. Ultimately, the work boat was hoisted back up on deck with the pilot and UAV along for the ride. Uh, we always sent one, either Jared or myself, out in the work boat to collect the, the UAV just to handle it. Uh, the, the deck hands were amazing humans, but uh, delicacy was not uh, one of their strong suits. And uh, we were worried about breaking this delicate foam uh, UAV, so we, we handled it. Uh, I'm going to share with you some of the imagery and results, but first I want to talk about uh, a few of the challenges we faced. Uh, we flew early morning or late evening to keep the solar angle below 45 degrees uh, to, to minimize the sun glint. Captain Jan taught me how to use the sextant for unnecessarily precise measurements of the solar elevation. I'd say our, our biggest challenge was, was the wind. Uh, while the town was rated up to 40 kilometers per hour winds, we launched only when the winds were below 25 kilometers per hour with winds aloft being higher. Uh, squalls were an issue. They formed quickly and could sneak up. Uh, once we landed ahead of an approaching squall in Beaufort 5 conditions, uh, and it was uncomfortable and uh, scary, but the, but the drone landed safely. Uh, a couple of system performance challenges with compass deviation on board the ship was a little tricky to, to sort out. Uh, had some camera focus issues, failing servo, corroding motors, and we had one battery failure, uh, which uh, made for an interesting flight. Uh, wildlife interactions didn't end up being a big concern. We did have several occasions where red-tailed tropic birds as well as red-footed boobies would come by to, to check out our drone, but they, they just seemed curious, not so much territorial, and uh, left it alone for the most part. Uh, there's a picture of one red-tailed tropic bird that photobombed one of our surveying photos. Yeah, mission planning was was a challenge as well, just with um, with a few factors. One being the fixed wing. Uh, it's pretty fundamental to plan your mission with turns into the wind for um, for a more efficient flight plan, as well as better uh, better data integrity. Just that the the camera on this. Uh, uh, on this UAV has no gimbal, and so wherever the belly of the uh, aircraft is pointed is where your camera's pointed, and so you really want to be a flat and level, good attitude flight when you're taking photos. Um, the other challenge was with the, that the ship was on the move many of the times, and so it made it tricky to find an optimal solution uh, for the for the flight plan. One last thing I'll mention about this is that creating a mission plan uh, visually using a base map, uh, you usually have roads and trees and houses. Uh, perhaps for scale, um, but this was just a plain blue base map, and so you had to be very careful with your uh, waypoint placement and measuring all the distances between them because you didn't have any intuitive uh, scale built in uh, like you do when you're mission planning over features that you're accustomed to. And then just challenges associated with beyond visual line of sight flight. Um, we were constantly monitoring all the critical parameters on the telemetry, you know, the altitude, airspeed, wind speed, attitude, distance from home and connectivity, and uh, most of all the battery voltage. Uh, unlike a lot of the well integrated uh, UAV systems, the battery percentage was absolutely useless. We had to track the battery voltage itself very closely and, and actually had a printed battery voltage discharge curve that we were tracking and, and watching how those voltage would drop over time. Um, while the Talon was airborne, we took, uh, took turns on the ground control station and with the binoculars, that's Jared in the background perched and watching the Talon with the the binoculars and and don't let the quick uh, selfie here fool you as most you know even when everything is going well it's still intensive and, and focused work so then when the flight is over the fun part begins analyzing the images here's a, a sample image from the talon and another 
And here you can uh, you can see one piece of debris. Not sure if uh, it comes through on the Teams meeting, but uh, it's highlighted there in in red, the ghost net. One other example, here's a red piece of junk of some sort. And then this one, uh, this probably just looks like a blue rectangle to you. And, um, you know, anecdotally, overcast conditions provided the best lighting, uh, flatter light, and of course, the, the calmer water surface, uh, the calmer the water surface is, the easier it is to identify debris as opposed to wave crests and, and glint. Uh, and this ended up being in those sort of ideal conditions of overcast and and calm, and uh, it might be hard to tell, but there's lots of debris in just this one photograph. So for the post-processing piece, we use the ocean cleanups, convolutional neural network, object detection flow, and the output of the CNN was manually validated, uh, meaning we looked at each of the suspected detections and validated those. Um, the QGIS was used for mapping uh, validated detections. Here's a sample of cropped debris detections. Uh, anecdotally, we saw lots of nets and ropes, crates and buckets, buoys, and unidentifiable shards and fragments. Uh, here's a sample output map from, from one of the flights. Image footprints are shown in blue. Detected objects are shown in red with icon sizes that correspond to the measured size of the debris. Uh, the area scanned, number of validated detections, and the calculated concentration are shown in the bottom right. Uh, that's the number of uh, debris pieces larger than 50 centimeters per square kilometer. So some flights had lower concentrations maybe due to the conditions, maybe due to the actual concentration. Uh, and we had some flights result in very high concentrations. Uh, again, function of the conditions as well as the actual concentration. So just to be clear, these are all preliminary results of this work. This is not published work and the analysis is still ongoing uh, by the folks at the ocean cleanup and the, the final results will, will likely differ. Um, in total, we conducted 22 successful flights. Uh, we amassed over 21,000 images, 2,416 total debris detections, and 93.7 square kilometers covered in, in total. Aggregate debris concentration was 25.23 uh, pieces uh, per square kilometer. Again, this is only those uh, pieces larger than 50 centimeters. And we saw a maximum of 77.5 pieces per square kilometer in one 4.4 uh, uh, square kilometer survey. So looking back at the goals, how did we do? You know, one, did this platform work for this application? Uh, yes, with limitations, uh, primarily with the, the area covered. Um, number two, will the data help to better understand the composition of the GPGP? Yes, uh, limited data set, but yeah, it will help. And three, can the UAV data be used to guide the trash collection device to local hotspots? Uh, it's likely possible, but that piece is still a work in progress. So if we look back at this graph from before, our goal was to help illuminate the category of largest debris greater than 50 centimeters. As mentioned, we were seeing uh, pieces per square kilometer concentrations up to 77 point. 5, 5, uh, with an overall concentration over the, the 94 square kilometers that we surveyed of 25.23 uh, pieces per square kilometer. So this is preliminary data and a relatively small data set, but it appears to show that at least in some localities, the concentration of large debris could be significantly higher than previously estimated and uh, with more data could help to refine the scope of the overall problem and the, the cleanup effort. So as mentioned, the other implication of this work is a potential to guide the trash collecting device. You know, if a pilot team is out ahead creating an updated heat map of the GPGP and can use that knowledge to guide the cleaning systems, then efficiencies can be gained. The fuel costs are one of the major components to this operation. And so harnessing UAV technology to realize efficiencies could be a big win for the ocean cleanup and for the oceans. 
Uh, future de developments, you know, we were constrained in the area we could cover in a single flight. I think, uh, you know, everyone would like to see that area increase. Uh, could be enhancements to the camera sensor or endurance of the UAV will help in that space. Um, doing the object detection with onboard hardware and software on the UAV uh, using machine learning at the edge uh, is a, another future potential enhancement. You know, this is the way the technology is headed and it's still difficult to do, but uh, will be possible in the future. Could have a true real-time guided plastic collection system. Of course, also satellite detection would help with scaling up these capabilities on a global level. Um, I'm not an expert on that subject, but there are many out there working on it and it could redefine this effort. Uh, some of the references used uh, in the presentation today, and uh, I hope I provide a little illumination to the labyrinth we find ourselves in, and please mind your appetite. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Nick. Um, I agree. That was a really insightful presentation um, about the GPGP, which I now know the shorthand for. Um, yeah, and I really appreciated the couple of introductory slides just you know, talking about the spatial, the geospatial spread of uh, humanity's impact. So kudos again on a successful mission. Um, totally agree with you that UAVs are powerful, but scary. Um, and I'm sure that this planning mission took many, many hours of prep um, for a field of research um, that not many people do. So good work. Um, with that, um, let's open up a couple minutes of directed questions for Nick. Is there anyone in the audience um, that has questions for Nick? And just again, um, raise, use the raise your hand icon and turn on your camera. Well, I'm not seeing any any come through. Um, I did have a couple questions for you. Um, again, seem like a super, <laughs> super scary um, and anxiety inducing application. Um, do you have any plans? It sounds like there's more research that needs to be done. Um, do you have any future plans to go back out and um, conduct recurrent missions? Yeah, good question. Uh, no plans at the moment. Uh, I think that possibility exists, but uh, nothing on the books. All right, uh, looks like Morgan. Morgan, you don't have to turn your camera on if you can. I know it's difficult for you, but go ahead. It works if I'm not presenting. Um, I, I was, I, I think it's really, really interesting. Um, I was sort of curious about um when you're doing object detection i guess you said that that the ocean plastics folks already had a model that they had developed and and validated and that's what you were using um but i guess i have two questions about that um and and that is you know there are a lot of things that you're, you're you like you showed that a white a blue, basically a blue image you know with all these little specks and um and it seems like basically anything in the water that's not blue, it is plastic. Is that, I mean, is that, I guess maybe that's true or, you know, there's, there's not much um, biology at the surface, so to speak. Um, and then, and then, which is, I guess, maybe more of a comment than a question, but my, my other question is when you did overlapping images, um, if you mentioned this, I missed it. How do you, how do you um, get rid of, objects that are detected in sequential images, because presumably the object itself is moving a little bit and, and maybe moving within the water column. And so it looks different if you, it seems like if you're just trying to characterize what's out there, you'd actually maybe not want overlapping images. So you don't have to deal with that. I don't know if you have more detailed thoughts about that sort of aspect. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I didn't see, very much biological debris out there. Of course, there is, as well as not debris. There's uh, mola mola, uh, what is it, ocean sunfish that we did see at the surface, not in any of our images, but they we saw them in transit. Uh, and sea turtles is a possibility as well. Um, you know, I had images that 
could be a sea turtle, could be a ghost net, not sure, those sort of green uh, round blob. Um, didn't necessarily have the resolution to pick that out. Um, in terms of the, the duplicates, yeah, so when we were seeing small, low concentrations, having the duplicate images wasn't really um, a significant factor to weed those out. It was relatively simple. And, you know, when you have very few detections and you're looking at those, you know, crops of detected objects, and it was fairly easy to tell, especially when they're coming from sequential images. Um, but when the concentrations got higher, then it got a lot harder, you know, there could have been a half a dozen white jugs out there, you know, and so were you counting the same one, you're saying three of them two different times. Um, so I think that problem does need a little bit more attention and some of that work is, is left to the ocean cleanup folks, you know, just from my scope on this. Um, I think what would help is that having that review of the crops be geo referenced so you can actually see where they're at because the way it was the flow we we're using we didn't necessarily have the geolocation that, that the data exists we just weren't able to see it in that validation flow so I think that would help uh, seeing if uh, if detections were co-located. Any follow up, Morgan, before I move on to um, Eric, who has a question? OK, Eric, um, if you're able, please turn on your camera. But if you're not, um, go ahead with your question. Hi, I don't have a camera, but um, yeah, I, I was curious if you could speak a little bit more about the scale of the area that you're covering. Um, and you showed how you know how how big those grids are, but how how does that compare? I think the area that you're covering versus the area that the boat the boats cover in in 10 in an hour or so of your flight uh, how you, you i think you mentioned that one of the things you want to improve was the endurance and the coverage of the area and how much do you need to improve that to 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 compare to what the boats are covering and things like that yeah right good question eric uh you know i did mention uh some of the sizes of an individual flight you know on a 90 minute uh or 86 minute was our maximum flight. We're able to cover up to 6.2 square kilometers was the, the largest um, area we, we covered in a single flight. Um, yeah, I, I haven't necessarily mapped that out. Um, the, the ships when they are towing, you know, we were doing a whole series of tests while we were out there. This is the very first time the system was put together. You know, a lot of the times the system was either being brought back in for some problem or repairs or being put back out. And that whole process took a lot. Um, but we did some tests with towing it at like one and a half up to like two and a half knots. So not particularly fast, um, but how that relates to the area covered with the with the UAV. Uh, yeah, I haven't necessarily mapped that out, but I do know that the, there's pressure there and that the desire is to have uh, more area covered per flight. Uh, that would that would obviously be ideal. And there's also, you know, investigations happening into the satellite. Uh, debris detection, but uh, it sounds like there are definitely some ongoing challenges with being able to do that reliably. Great, thanks. All righty. Um, I think we'll hold off on questions there because um, we are reaching the end of the meeting. So just again, I wanted to thank both of the speakers for being willing and open to presenting with us today. Um, really insightful. I enjoyed the juxtaposition of uh, Morgan and Nick's talk. Um, and we're not going to have time for much of a Q&A session today, um, but we will get to that in a second. Um, so I encourage any of you that might have additional follow-up questions to reach out to Nick or Morgan directly. Um, I think that they had their emails on their slides, um, and we can also provide those. So we have one final polling question that we'd like to get responses from the audience before um, maybe we end on, you know, one or two more questions. So please again, um, click the link in the chat, um, go to Slido and enter that code or use your phone um, with a QR code uh, to answer the final polling question. So um, this is something that I asked recently on the remote sensing forum page. We have a, for those of you that don't know, we have a question and answer section of the Teams page. Um, it's kind of hidden. All of us are kind of getting used to the format of using Microsoft Teams. Um, 
but I'd like to get more information on how your organization or you specifically store metadata for remotely sensed data sets. Um, so do you have specific tools or code? Um, is there a structure to, you know, a hierarchy that you classify your folder and metadata information? Um, we're interested in also trying to um, learn more about how different organizations collect this data, compile it, um, and store it uh, so that we can, you know, kind of guide our own practices. So if you have any, I know this is this might be a question that not many people have standards for. Um, and again, it doesn't look like anything's coming in. So something that we should <laughs> something that we should keep an eye on as we move forward. Spreadsheets, great. Yeah, I know other people like we're able to extract um, obviously coordinate information and camera parameters from UAV imagery. Uh, pretty random, yeah. There's no set methodology. I think I'd come I'd come across some um, USGS code recently where you can encode metadata into image files as well. So I can link that in the Teams page. Drone flight software, Word documents. Yeah, this is all really helpful. Um, so again, just in using these polling questions to kind of guide the things that we should focus on or continue to think about as a community. Um, so yeah, look, keep us keep us informed um, and feel free to share resources either directly with us or on the Teams page. Um, I'll end things here with the polling question because it doesn't look like there's there's much specific tools, but I'd like to open it back up for just a few minutes of final Q&A for either of our speakers. Um, is there anyone else in the audience that had questions, comments um, for Morgan or Nick before um, we wrap up the meeting? Everybody wants just, lunch. <laughs> yeah. I, don't know. I mean, I'm not letting anybody off that easy. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Um, maybe I'll just ask one. Um, and Morgan, this is for you. Um, so I was just curious about your code. It sounded like it was a really helpful tool and model that you had spent a lot of, you and the folks at NOAA had spent a lot of time developing. And I know that you said right now you're running it through the um, Harris Geospatial, Geospatial MV platform. Um, but have you and others at NOAA put any further consideration into developing this into kind of like a standalone tool since this application seems so widely useful and um, given all of the time and effort that went into training um, such an involved model? Um, yes, so I've given some thought to that. We haven't invested a lot of time. We're still, we still feel like we're kind of in the a bit of the R and D phase. Um, I would love to create something, you know, that um, is just freely available for others to to use, um, and maybe we could go that route down down the road. Um, but I'm not really, a, you know, I'm a biologist, and not a developer. But now I've gotten kind of pulled into that world a little bit, and so. Um, this is partially why we went with commercially available software. I spent a lot of time actually trying to develop my own um, uh, neural network model to do this classification just on my own. And um, I was never happy with the sort of performance that I was able to get out of the, the model and um, had market improvement going with this, this sort of other platform. Um, we do a lot of the, sort of post-processing, I do that in R. And so I have, um, once we have classified images, all of the other geospatial um, analyses sort of assign, you know, summing up um, water areas and other metrics that we pull out of this that I didn't talk about today, I didn't have time, but um, the other things that we pull out of this and then um, cataloging all that, I do that, that in R, um, so that would be, code that's available, but you need the sort of classified images, which is not really the, the meat of it, of course. So yeah, that was a long way useful. of saying, yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, 
it's probably going to take a bigger collaboration with some folks that are much savvier than I am in order to um, generate something that that is open source and works as well as what we have now. Yeah. Um, well, answer. yeah, thank you for that. I think the, you know, one of the biggest focuses of the forum is to get information out to the people in the community. And so this is a good starting point of just knowing who is the person to contact if you, you know, want to maybe obtain some of that code or talk about code um, and who does what. So it looks like we do have um, one more question from Sarah. Yeah, Sarah, go ahead. Hi, yes. I just wanted to say on a very different scale, we have just been using the ArcGIS image classification on our drone imagery, and we've had really good success with that, identifying um, the different, we're looking at emergent wetland plant communities and, and also water. Um, and then we have been doing the post analysis uh, we've used R, but uh, recently we've transitioned to using Tableau, which is uh, also has a, a free version for the public. If you aren't familiar with Tableau, you should look into it for managing large sets of data. And, um, you know, I think that Sneha and I at LSEP are going to be submitting an abstract to present some of that work. And so I think that depending on the scale of your project and your question, different tools are useful. And I'm excited that we are all talking about it. So I'm glad I was able to come today. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Sarah. I'm glad you um, you were able to join. We've been trying to get you here for a while, so I appreciate it. <laughs> um, OK, well, yeah, thank you for ending on that note as well. Yeah, this is all about collaboration and getting the information into the hands of the users. And um, yeah, appreciate everybody that was able to come on the call today. Um, I'll wrap things up here. because I know that most of us probably want food. Um, so again, thank you for joining us. Amy, do you have any final send off words? No, no, you were covering <laughs> it. Thanks so much for being here. Um, thanks again to the presenters. Great job. And uh, yeah, we'll be in touch soon with information about the March meeting. <laughs>